we go. All right, I'm going to start very promptly because we've got a lot to cover. And um, I am Jane Andrews. I am the events chair for the League of Women Voters of San Diego, and it's great to see so many faces and be in person. Um, we do have a lot to cover, so we are first going to do the California propositions, and then secondly, we will do the San Diego ballot measures. There is a lot to cover, but we are going to have a, a short pause at the end of each item to see if there may be one or two questions. Um, and we have two very seasoned, longtime league members who are going to be our speakers. The first is Jenny Avena, who's going to talk about the California propositions. And then second, we have Mary Hansen, who will speak about the San Diego propositions. We have to be out of here by 7.45, so we do need to move things along. So uh, Mary's going to start. I hope this will inspire you to learn even more <laughs> about all of these issues. The uh, best way place to go, again, is our website, lwvsandiego.org. And um, if you go there, you can click on, um, what's this called? Ballot? I can't read it. How to make ballot choices. And you'll also find access to lots of great resources. My favorite is Voter's Edge. And um, with Voter's Edge, you can find out as just, you can get a sketch, uh, a thumbnail sketch of these props and measures, or you can really dive deep. There are a lot of editorials and articles and, and uh, just all kinds of information, and it's customized to you. So you go in, put in your address, and you, your ballot pops up with everything you're going to be voting on. So I'm a huge fan of Voter's Edge, and I think a lot of you are in, the, in this room as well. Um, there are, well, where'd they go? Out by the registration table, there are little uh, bookmarks that have the uh, web address for Voter's Edge. So in addition to going over these particular propositions and measures, we like to kind of give you a framework for how to evaluate them. You have to keep in mind that getting something on the ballot, particularly at the state level, is a big commitment. It takes a lot of money, time, resources. Somebody really wants to change the status quo. Somebody has an agenda. And I don't mean that in a negative way, but you know, it's it's a big deal to get something on the ballot. So as a voter, you're thinking, well, I'm, I have that same agenda. This is something I've wanted for years. I'm, I'm all for this, or maybe not so much. So what is it they want to change from the status quo? Who benefits? How much will it cost? These uh, questions are all the ones you want to ask. <coughs> we always have to have this disclaimer. And if you look, I saw somebody there. Would you rate, lift up your, um, I should have had this with me. Even in this material that you're getting from the Secretary of State, it will say that the arguments pro and con have not necessarily been vote, vetted for accuracy. So we try, as the Secretary of State and the Registrar of Voters and the City Clerk, when it comes to the analysis to be as objective, uh, as factual as we can, but those pro and con arguments are basically what the supporters and opponents are saying so you have to view them with a little skept healthy skepticism, in my opinion. Critical thinking. Um, the state propositions, they can make new laws, uh, statutes, they can amend the Constitution, and the Constitution uh, generally can't be amended without a vote of the people. And most of the measures that Jenny will be talking with you about came about as a signature drive, as an initiative. The first one, which she will do, however, was put on the ballot by the legislature. So here they are. Fortunately for us, it's a shorter list than usual, but I'd say daunting nonetheless. So Jenny, go for it. Okay, let me. All right, I'll try not to wander away from this microphone. I think it wants me to be close. So my name is Jenny Avena, 
Welcome, everyone. Thank you for being here. It's great to be in person again. Um, you know, 2020, everything was on Zoom, so I love seeing all your faces. I might be a little bit rusty, so have some patience with me. Um, as Mary said, um, there's some, well, clearly we're not going to go over every detail tonight. There's a lot to get through. There are some great resources that Mary pointed out that you can look at after we talk about the um, propositions when you go home. I also want to make a small plug for the Legislative Analyst Office. If you don't know what that is, that's the nonpartisan state government office that looks at all these propositions and does an analysis um, of the effect on the budget. So you can go on their website and particularly for maybe some of the numbers that we might not have at our fingertips tonight, um, it can help you with a little bit more information. So let's get started. All right, um, our first proposition is Proposition 1. That seems logical. Um, this is an amendment to the California Constitution, and it was placed on the ballot by the California legislature. If passed, it will add a specific right to reproductive freedom to the California Constitution. In order to pass, it needs 50% uh, or more of voters to vote yes on this. You're all likely familiar with the uh, federal Supreme Court case Roe v. Wade and what's been going on with that. But just briefly, that case decided in 1973, recognized a protected right to choose an abortion in the US Constitution. Since then, states and Congress have enacted legislation to define and limit that right. And throughout the years, the right to choose an abortion was upheld by the Supreme Court, even as limits to it were sometimes also upheld. However, in June of this year, the Supreme Court announced its decision in Dobbs versus Jackson Women's Health Organization, and that struck down the holding in Roe, eliminating any federal protection for the right to choose an abortion. The reasoning behind the opinion has raised some concerns that other constitutionally protected rights might be at jeopardy, including the right to make personal choices about reproductive contraceptives. As this slide notes, in light of that decision, the California legislature put forward this proposition with the intent to protect reproductive freedom in California. Currently, California law does guarantee the right to have an abortion, with some exceptions, and the right to privacy about personal reproductive decisions. But because those rights are created through legislation, they can also be stripped by a vote of the legislation, uh, sorry, the legislature. Um, by recognizing the specific rights in the California Constitution, they cannot be removed except for a vote of two-thirds of the electorate. There's just a little bit more protection there. Specifically, after passage of Prop 1, the California Constitution would say that the state shall not deny or interfere with an individual's reproductive freedom in their most intimate decisions, which includes their fundamental right to choose to have an abortion and their fundamental right to choose or refuse contraceptives. As far as the fiscal impacts, the state legislative analyst office that I just mentioned um, finds that there would be no anticipated impacts on the state budget as the proposition doesn't create or expand any rights that don't already exist. Okay, so each of our propositions will have a support and oppose slide and you can see the supporters of um, each proposition and then the, the opponents. And as it says, the signers of the official arguments are in bold, although I don't know how well you can see that there. But And then each slide will also have, at least for the state propositions, the amount of campaign money that's been raised um, either in support or in opposition. And I want to just take a minute to highlight that and maybe keep a little running total in your head about how much money is spent on all these propositions. So uh, here you can see the supporters for this proposition. And I will note on this one that the League of Women Voters of California is an official signer in support of this proposition. That's the only time that we'll talk about our position um, tonight is if we're an official signer. The arguments made by supporters for this are that Prop 1 will enshrine the fundamental rights to abortion and contraception in the California Constitution, and that doctors, nurses, and other health professionals agree that Prop 1 is necessary to keep intimate medical decisions with individuals and their health providers. So there's the um, opponents of Proposition 1, and they argue that women already have the right to choose under current California law, and that the recent US Supreme Court ruling won't change that, and, and didn't change that and won't change that. 
and this proposition is not needed to protect women's health or their reproductive rights, and that it's an extreme and costly proposal that allows unrestricted late-term abortions and punishes taxpayers, and that abortion seekers from outside California will swamp California resources. So just to recap, a yes vote means that you're in favor of amending the California Constitution to guarantee reproductive rights, including contraception and abortion, and a no means that you're not in favor of um, amending the Constitution to guarantee those rights. So I'll pause for a second to see if we have one or two questions. I feel like this one is pretty straightforward. There's one in the back. That is an excellent question. <laughs> There's, you know, I've looked that up several times, and um, the initiative generally is used when it is something that's a sign a ballot. It's put on the ballot because of um, a drive for signatures, like when they're out in the public. Whereas this was put on the ballot by the legislature. However, propositions. I see them used at the state level, and then we don't see them used at the local level. But I, on, to be honest, I haven't found a definitive, you know, line between the two of them. I don't know, Mary. Have you seen anything? Uh, they're all called propositions at the state level, whether they're a referendum, whether the legislature put them on, whether it was a uh, signature drive. So yeah, you're you're right about that. Yeah, yeah. I really haven't found anything definitive because I love definitions that are very clear, but. Any other questions on that, this one? Okay, all right, we'll move on to Proposition 26, and I think what I'll do is Proposition 26 and 27 together because they're so closely related, and that way if you have questions afterwards, um, we can talk about them together. So bear with me while I give you a lot of information. All right, so Proposition 26 is the second of three uh, proposed constitutional amendments, and the first of the two about gambling. This proposition allows in-person roulette, dice games, and sports wagering on tribal lands, and it was put forward by a coalition of tribes. It requires a simple majority to pass. In 2018, the Supreme Court of the United States struck down a federal law banning sports betting, and since then, 35 states have allowed some form of sports betting. Currently, both the California Constitution and state law limit gambling in California, Specifically, state law bans sports betting, roulette, and games with dice. And I want to pause here for a second and explain a little bit more about the term sports betting. I know for me, I'm not a huge gambler, so I wasn't sure what exactly that meant. Um, sports betting is betting on the outcome of a sports or an athletic game. And to be accurate, it can also be betting on something that occurs during the game, such as like when the first goal will be or something to that effect. But it has to do with the outcomes in an athletic contest. Um, this is currently illegal in California with the exception of horse racing. California does allow lottery, card games, and slot machines, mainly on tribal lands. Um, the state has compacts with 79 tribes to allow gaming on those tribal lands. And those compacts require the tribes to pay into several funds that are used to send money to tribes that don't operate casinos and to cover the regulatory costs to the state, payments to local governments, and to fund gambling addiction programs. Proposition 26 would allow in-person roulette, dice games, and sports wagering on tribal lands if the tribe enters into a gaming compact approved by the state. The tribe would be able to choose if the age limit for gambling was 18 or 21. I mean, th theoretically something else in between. Uh, the prop would also allow all sports wagering in person at the four licensed horse racing tracks uh, in California for people 21 and over. And if you don't, you're not aware, that's in Alameda, Orange County, Los Angeles, and then of course here in San Diego. The tracks would pay taxes um, to the state on all the bets made, and the proposition would prohibit the marketing of sports betting to persons under the age of 21. It would also allow private lawsuits to enforce certain gambling laws. Betting on high school games and games in which a California college participated would be prohibited. The fiscal effect of Prop 26 is largely unknown. New tribal compacts and increased taxes from racetrack betting could increase state revenues. The cost to enforce and regulate new betting would also increase. Tax revenue left after deducting the costs of sports betting regulation would be divided as follows. 70% to the state general fund, 
15% to programs dealing with gaming, mental health research, and 15% to the Department of Justice for enforcing gaming laws. So the majority of the revenue would go to our state general fund, and it doesn't sound like it would be restricted, so it could be used for whatever programming the, the um, governor and legislature came up with. Here's some of the supporters of this proposition, and their arguments in support are that it limits sports wagering to adults only, it supports Indian self-reliance by providing revenue for tribal education, health care, and other vital source services. It promotes safe, responsible gaming, and it helps stop and prevent illegal gambling. Um, and it authorizes sports wagering in person at tribal casinos. It's the most responsible approach to authorizing sports wagering and would promote American Indian self-reliance. Those are, the, yeah, quite a bit of money there. All right, the opponents to this proposition argue that it's a massive expansion of gambling that will lead to more underage gambling and addiction. It's sponsored by five wealthy gaming tribes who want to expand their monopoly on gaming to include sports betting. It will devastate other communities of color. It would leave casino workers unprotected from worker safety, wage and hour harassment, and anti-discrimination laws. And it will increase the popularity of horse racing, leading to more horses being mistreated. So a yes vote means tribal casinos and racetracks could offer in-person sports betting and casinos could expand other gaming options. There'd be new ways to seek enforcement of certain state gambling laws. A no vote means that sports betting would continue to be illegal in California. Tribal ca casinos would continue to be unable to offer roulette and games played with dice and no changes would be made to the way the state gambling laws are enforced. All right, so hold all of that in your head. And we're going to jump to Proposition 27. Yes. And then we'll have maybe a little more time for questions afterwards. Okay. So Proposition 27 is the last constitutional amendment that we'll go over and the second one dealing with gambling. This proposition would allow online and mobile sports wagering outside of tribal lands. So online and mobile sports wagering, whereas the other one was all in-person sports wagering. It was put forward by an organization called Californians for Solutions to Homelessness and Mental Health Support, and that's funded primarily by Bet MGM and the owners of FanDuel, Sportsbook, and DraftKings, which if you're not aware, are online betting platforms. Um, a simple majority approval will pass this amendment. All right, so as noted previously, the federal law banning sports betting was struck by the Supreme Court in 2018. There's a lot of money to be had in online sports betting, and California is a huge pool of potential bettors, so that's why you're seeing all this money and you know, competition pouring into our state right now. Okay, again, Proposition 27 deals with sports betting, where bets are made on the outcome of athletic events. Prop 27 would also allow some betting on non-athletic events, such as award shows and video game competitions. It does ban betting on high school games, and I am going to editorialize for the only time today on elections. Thank goodness, right? <laughs> the main difference to note here from the last proposition is that it would allow online sports betting rather than just in-person betting. Online sports betting would be allowed for adults 21 and older. The proposition allows two groups to obtain a license to run online sports betting. First would be American Indian tribes um, that could offer betting underneath their own name and they would pay a $10 million licensing fee to the state with a $1 million renewal fee every five years. The second uh, category of, of people that could get a license are the actual gambling companies that offer betting under their company name. <coughs> Excuse me. They would be required to have a marketing agreement with a tribe that has a state compact for gaming, and they must pay an initial fee of $100 million to the state with a $10 million renewal fee every five years. <laughs> Only companies that operate in at least 10 states can obtain such licenses. Prop 27 also creates a new division in the California Department of Justice to regulate online sports betting. As to the fiscal effects, they're uncertain. Licensed operators must pay after deduction of specified expenses 10% of the total sports bets made each month to the California Online Sports Betting Trust Fund. Out of that 10%, state regulatory costs must be paid first. The remaining funds 
out of the 10% would be split with 15% going to tribes not involved in online sports betting and 85% going to homelessness programs and gambling addiction programs. Money to address homelessness would be provided to local entities for use similar to how funds are um, distributed now. Revenues from online sports betting would not be includable in the state's general fund, meaning the funds could not be used on other things, including education. The Legislative Analyst's Office finds that it's unlikely that the increase in state revenues from this proposition would exceed $500 million annually, and there may be increased costs in the form of government assistance for people with gambling addictions. Okay, so here we have the supporters of Prop 27, again, particularly in these two, note the amounts of money being uh, spent on this campaign. The arguments for this proposition are that Prop 27 requires the use of state-of-the-art technology to ensure that minors don't place bets. It has substantial fines for violators and bans betting on youth sports. It requires strict auditing of the use of money in the trust fund to make sure the money is appropriately used and will provide millions of dollars to support programs that alleviate homelessness, mental health, and addiction in California. And finally, Prop 27 requires that 15% of all tax revenue go to disadvantaged non-gaming tribes. In opposition to this, um, those that are opposed say that online sports betting will not generate jobs or create investment in the state because the sports betting operators will retain most of the profits. Allowing promotional offers, so that promotional offers are one of the specified expenses that can be deducted prior to calculating the state's 10% cut. So allowing promotion offers to be deducted from the gross betting revenue on, uh, will reduce the revenue available to the state. It will allow online bets to be placed with a credit card, putting problem gamblers at risk of easily incurring large amounts of debt. And the National Council on Problem Gambling found that online gambling is far more addictive than in-person gambling, and gamblers are five times more likely to develop a problem. Prop 27 is a deceptive measure promoted by out-of-state companies, and it's not a solution to homelessness and will open more people to gambling addictions. All right, so there we've got a recap of what yes on 27 means, that licensed tribes or gambling companies could offer online sports betting to those 21 and over um, on non-tribal lands, and then a no means that sports betting would continue to be illegal in California. No changes would be made to the way laws are enforced. So I have a little, what's the difference? And I'm, my notes are a little off of this, so I'm gonna show you the whole, whole thing there. The main difference is between the two gambling-related amendments. Prop 26 only allows sports betting in person, in casinos and racetracks, while Prop 27 allows betting online. Prop 26 also legalizes roulette and other game di dice games in casinos and is largely backed by Native American tribes. Prop 27 would allow out-of-state companies to partner with tribes who may not have casinos, and some of those revenues could go to alleviating homelessness. Another question we get a lot is, as far as which proposition, proposition will go into effect if both of them pass, um, there's a little bit of argument about that, but what the general consensus seems to be is that if both propositions pass, and Proposition 27 actually got more support, then both propositions would be effective because Prop 27 has some language in it saying it doesn't conflict with 26 because they were sort of anticipating this. Conversely, if both of them pass and 26 has more support, it's likely that the support, the um, sponsors of 26 would you know, want to take that to court and try to challenge Prop 27. So. Okay, any questions? No, I've made it crystal clear. Uh, okay. I think you had your hand up first. Uh, so let's see, 27, yeah, I think 27 only specifically calls out high school gains and elections, yeah. Yes, ma'am. Um, well, because, I mean, technically, if you're in California and you're, betting on it, you're doing something illegal. That's not to say that people don't do that. There is some, I, I don't know what people do, but there is some um, language to the effect of talking about how online sports betting would be um, regulated in that these companies are supposed to be using technology that does things like geofence you, 
where supposedly it knows where you are and it knows who you're next to and it's not going to allow someone under 21 or 18 to bet. Um, it's going to know if you're in California or not. Uh, okay, so, okay. I know the answer. Well, okay, I mean, beyond what I said, I can't really give you more information than that, but I could repeat what I said. But yeah, I mean, I guess that's up to you to kind of dig in a little more and see where you think the money is really gonna end up. I think there's a lot of money money to be made for a lot of people, right? For you? If they both don't pass, mm -hmm. but remained in California, the sports betting is illegal, right? Yes. And yet there is the horse track betting. Yes. Right? Yeah, that is the one exception to yeah, the ban on. Well, it is, but it's it's allowed. Through, there's been sort of an erosion over the years of you know what is legal and what's not. So, okay. sport or horse track racing is allowed to be bet on. That is possible, okay. yeah. And then it would just stay the way it is. So we'll take, how about one more? You have one, or maybe two more. I was just thinking in my head, there's so much homelessness and so much contradictory on Prop 27 that's supposed to prevent the money, Organic 27 that's supposed to prevent homelessness. But when you gamble, you're gambling all your money away, and you lose the roof over Well, the yeah, that's, a, that's something for everybody to think about, right? You know, I mean, and, that's why we say the arguments are for you to think critically about and see how you feel about about the argument, right? A quick question. Where does our mayor stand on it? I noticed there were some mayors that... Yeah, you know, I, I don't know at the moment. But maybe we can find that out in a little bit. Okay. All right, so does everyone feel like they have a, a better handle on it at least? I'll feel, I'll feel good if you have a better handle on it. How about that? Okay. <laughs> All right, so moving on to Prop 28, get through all my notes there. Okay, so Proposition 28 is an initiative put on the ballot through that signature gathering process, and it would provide additional funding for arts and music education in public schools, and it requires a simple majority approval to pass. In 1988, California voters passed Proposition 98, and it changed the California Constitution to require a minimum percentage of the state budget to be spent on K-12 through education, essentially about 40% of the state general fund. California's public schools serve about 6 million K-12 through students, and roughly 60% of those students are from low-income families. State law requires schools to provide arts and music education to all students in grades 1 through 6, and then to offer such courses as electives to 7th and 8th graders. High school students generally must complete one year of arts and music education or a foreign language or a career technical education uh, to graduate. However, about half of California high school students, their graduation requirements are aligned with the UC and state school systems, so they're actually required uh, to do one year of visual or performing arts to graduate. There is currently no guaranteed source of annual funding in the state budget specifically for arts and music education in K-12 through public schools. If Prop 28 passes, the state would be required to set aside from the general fund an amount equal to at least 1% of the total Prop 98 funding received by schools the prior year and apply those funds to arts and music education. This funding would be in addition to what would already be guaranteed by Prop 98. As schools would receive, all schools would receive some funding per pupil, however those serving low-income students would receive additional money. Larger schools would be required to spend 80% of the funding to hire new staff and 20% for training and supplies. Local governing boards would be required to certify annually that their schools spent the funding provided by Prop 28 on arts and music education and to report that information publicly. The fiscal effect of Prop 28 would be to increase state expenditures by about $1 billion annually. That amount would come from the general fund, which is fund, uh, funded mainly by collected personal income taxes, sales tax, and corporation taxes. The increased expenditures from Prop 28 
would represent about one half of 1% of the state's total general fund. Passage of this proposition would not increase taxes and funding would come from existing general fund revenue sources. So supporters of Prop 28 say that it would increase funding for educational programs without raising taxes for Californians. Only one in five California public schools has a dedicated teacher for arts and music programs, and that arts and music education can improve a student's personal and academic life. So th there actually are no arguments submitted to the Secretary of State against Prop 28, and no contributions at the time that we put this together actually rose to the level of needing to be reported so we don't have anything there. Just to be, you know, uh, fair, we did find a Los Angeles Times editorial from last November that did cr criticize this proposition as ballot box budgeting as it reduces the ability to fund other programs that are equally as important. Okay. So that's a recap there. A yes means you approve of the proposed statute to provide additional funding for arts and music education, and a no means that you prefer for the funding for arts education to continue to depend on the state and local budget decisions. Is there any questions on that one? On to Proposition 29. Proposition 29 is an initiative put forward by the Service Employees International Union, United Healthcare Workers West. If passed, it will require on-site licensed medical professionals at kidney dialysis clinics and it establishes some other state requirements. It requires a simple majority to pass. So this is the third time that a proposition on the subject of kidney dialysis clinics has appeared on the ballot in the last five years, so it may look a little bit familiar. This version of the proposition is substantially similar to the one that was on the ballot in 2020. Both of the previous propositions were rejected by voters. Dialysis is a big business in the United States and in California with roughly 80,000 Californians receiving dialysis at one of the 650 dialysis centers each month. So two private dialysis clinic operators, DeVita and Fresenius, own and operate about 72% of California clinics. Payment for dialysis treatment comes mainly from Medicare, meaning the federal government foots the bill. State funds pay for patients on Medi-Cal, while patients with private insurance um, are covered for the first 30 months of their treatment. The majority of regulations that clinics must abide by are required by the federal government. Federal licensing regulations require each patient to be visited by their physician at the clinic at least once a month. Each clinic must employ a medical director that is a board certified physician, a position that's estimated to require about a quarter of the physician's working hours, implying that one physician could rotate among several different clinics. Reporting of patient infection data is required by the federal government. Similar to the proposition in 2020, Proposition 29 requires at least one licensed healthcare provider to be on site of a dialysis clinic during all treatment hours. It requires centers to report dialysis related infection data to state and federal governments. It prohibits centers from closing or reducing service services without state approval and it prohibits centers from refusing to treat patients based on the source of their payment for care. Proposition 29, however, does allow for the licensed healthcare provider to be a physician, a nurse practitioner, or a physician's assistant, and it does allow for telehealth option in some cases. Prop 29 also requires new reporting about ownership interests in clinics in the interest of transparency. The fiscal effect of Prop 29 would likely be budget neutral to the state of California. This is because despite the state needing new systems and new staffing in order to uh, enforce the new reporting requirements, they would most likely offset that with higher licensing fees for the clinics. It's possible that clinic operators would close centers due to the costs of meeting Prop 29 requirements, making it more difficult for patients to receive treatment, and if so, increased hospitalizations due to mistreatments could cost the state money. Okay, you can see the supporters of Prop 29 here, and they argue that requiring a physician, nurse practitioner, or physician assistant to be present during a dangerous procedure like dialysis is common sense and a matter of patient safety. Dialysis clinics may use telemedicine for up to a year if the required healthcare workers are not available, and the big corporations operating these clinics can easily make the required staffing changes while still profiting hundreds of millions of dollars a year. In opposition, 
opponents argue that dialysis is administered by specially trained technicians and every dialysis patient is already under the care of their own kidney doctor. This administrative oversight is unnecessary. Prop 29 would worsen our healthcare worker shortage, taking thousands of individuals from hospitals where they're needed and putting them in administrative positions. The unnecessary requirement for on-site administrators who do not provide patient care would cost hundreds of millions every year, forcing clinics to reduce hours or close, and new regulations introduced by this proposition are redundant as most of the issues are addressed already by federal regulation. There's our yes or no. A yes vote means chronic dialysis centers in California would need to increase staffing and reporting to the Department of Public Health, while a no vote means that things would remain the same and uh, primarily federal regulations would govern the dialysis clinics. All right, any questions on this one? Well, um, I guess that, <laughs> so the supporters, the people that are supporting putting this on to the ballot were a union, and then the people that are opposing this are the dialysis clinics. Well, yeah, is that what some of the supporters, or the opposition says? Yeah. Yeah, and I would encourage people, to, if you're curious about these questions, to look a little bit further. Maybe go to the organization that is a supporter or an opponent. Maybe they'll have a website that tells you a little bit more about it. It's also going to tell you a little bit about that organization and who they really represent, because sometimes the names are not always what you would think they are. Can you show the support link as well? Sure. Yeah. Okay. Um, let's see. How about in the blue shirt here? Oh, I can't hear her. Sorry. Patients are suffering right now because it's not monitored enough. I mean, is that what they're trying to say? There's not enough monitoring. I think they're trying to say that. I think if you ask both parties, they would give you different answers about that one, right? Did I hear you say that the primary care belongs to their original physician? Right. They're under the the care of their physician. It might be a primary care physician. It might be, a, you know, a, a, yeah, a nephrologist. There you go. Okay. Help oh, you, sir. So a yes vote well means you have to have a license. At all times, yes, yeah, and one more. Okay, well, it is, it's S-E-I-U, yeah, and it's their United Health Workers West, yeah. All right, and I'm going to keep going. Also, we're going to have this online, you know, there, and there's lots of information about it, just because we've got a couple more to go here. All right, Proposition 30. All right, this one is providing funding for programs to reduce air pollution and prevent wildfires by increasing the tax on personal income over $2 million. This is a citizen's initiative put forth by various businesses and environmental groups, and it will pass with a simple majority of voter approval. So California law requires our state to reduce its greenhouse gas emission to 40% below 1990 levels by 2030. It also requires ride-sharing vehicles, those that are run by Uber, Lyft, that kind of thing, to be 0%, sorry, 90% zero emission vehicles by 2030. And I'm going to shorten zero emission vehicles to ZEVs just for time constraints. And then in August, um, one of our agencies passed a regulation requiring 35% of all new cars sold in California to be ZEVs by 2026 and 100% by 2035. I think the slide says electric, and that's incorrect because there's other vehicles that would qualify as ZEVs that aren't electric. Okay, to reach those goals, there's a general consensus that the state's electrical grid requires upgrades to handle the increased capacity and that there will be, need to be some type of assistance going to a segment of the population to purchase typically high-cost SEVs. Currently, the state has allocated about $10 billion over the next five years to get this going. The other piece of this proposition relates to funding for wildfire suppression and prevention. State agencies are responsible for these duties on about a third of state land, while local and federal agencies are responsible for the rest. The state budget for wildfires this year is about $4 billion. All right, so last year, California raised more than $130 billion in revenue from personal income taxes. 
currently California has a budget surplus of $97 billion. Proposition 30 would increase the income tax rate by 1.75% on individual incomes above $2 million. If Proposition 30 passes, the rate for people married filing jointly will be 15.05% for each dollar above $2 million in income, and that would be the highest rate of any state in the United States. The tax increase would end on January 1st, 2043, or theoretically earlier if there are three consecutive calendar years in which statewide greenhouse gas emissions are 80% below the 1990 levels. Proposition 30 is expected to generate between three and five billion dollars in most years, increasing over time. These funds, net of expenses, would be allocated as follows. 45% of funds would promote the purchase of ZEVs, including subsidies and rebates for passenger vehicles and medium and heavy duty vehicles like trucks and buses. 35% of funds would increase the availability of ZEV infrastructure, including electric charging stations close to single and multifamily dwellings. 20% would help fund wildlife suppression, I'm sorry, wildfire suppression, <laughs> not wildlife suppression, wildfire suppression and prevention. Prop 30 stipulates that at least half of the funds allocated for ZEVs and ZEV charging must primarily benefit low income and disadvantaged communities. And it also requires that CAL FIRE make hiring and training additional firefighters a top priority for its funds. So we've got our supporters of Prop 30. They argue that Prop 30 will reduce catastrophic wildfires and air pollution from vehicles. Prop 30 taxes only the wealthiest 0.2% of Californians, ensuring they pay their fair share to help reduce air pollution. And then we've got the opponents to Prop 30. They argue that Californians are already paying high income taxes while they're facing high inflation. California has already allocated significant funds to ZEVs and to wildfire suppression and prevention. Additional funds can be paid from the state's surplus budget. California is already spending more than $50 billion for a multi-year climate investment, including that $10 billion for ZEVs. There is no guarantee that Prop 30 will make ZEVs affordable for most California families. Prop 30 locks money from income taxes, normally a major source of school funding, into special interests. And Prop 30 is Lyft's attempt to get taxpayers to help foot the bill for the requirement for them to increase the number of ZEVs used. How are ZEVs is mentioned twice at that time? Oh, you're right. They would probably like that, but <laughs> we'll, we'll have to fix that. Thank so you for noticing it. Is that good when you see the government and the Republican Party? The I can't tell you that one. <laughs> I think that's an opinion, right? All right. The uh, supporters? Okay. All right. So to recap, yes means you favor an increased tax um, and the targeted revenue for ZEVs. And then a no means that you would prefer the status quo and there would be no change in taxes for those making over $2 million. The increase in taxes only for those making over $2 million. Correct. Got it. Yes. All right, let's take two questions. Um, I can just say my what I've read uh, that he said is that he believes that it's really a ploy by you know Lyft and to get what that argument was that they're trying to get someone to pay their share of of converting over to Zevs. Um, I will say I read some things about you know that that companies like that already go to the government and ask for funding you know and grants. I don't know what the numbers on that are though, and if this would be significantly different. Yeah, how about behind, in the back there? Yep. No, you, uh, yep. My only thing is this is that recently San Diego and California have been hit hard with rolling blackouts and, you know, being able to not charge your vehicle during certain hours of the time of, of day due to, like, the major, major shortage of electricity mm -hmm. in California. So, I mean, I see this as a big problem on that end. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So I think I think one of you know the the 
yeah, I think the supporters would say that they're trying to address that with the funding, and the opponents would say, you're right, you know, why are we doing this? So, okay, let's get to our last proposition. I know you all are tired of hearing me talk, but um, we're almost done. Okay, Proposition 31 is a referendum on a 2020 law that would prohibit the sale of certain flavored tobacco products. It needs a majority vote to pass. So what's a referendum? In California, when a law is passed by the legislature and signed by the governor, entities and individuals that disagree with the law essentially can challenge it using the ballot box, and that's the referendum process. The entity or individual has 90 days from the date of enactment of the law to gather uh, to circulate a petition to voters and garner enough signatures to put the referendum on the ballot. At that point, once that petition has been qualified, the law cannot go into effect until voters have had their say on whether they'd like to see it go into effect. So that's where we are. This is a law from 2020, and this is the first opportunity for voters um, to weigh in on it. Okay, so you can see on our slide here who is funding the petition to put the referendum on the ballot. I'm not surprisingly, tobacco companies aren't thrilled with this. Um, the law as written bans the sale of all flavored tobacco products. The prohibition includes pods for vape pens, tank-based systems, menthol cigarettes, and chewing tobacco. It does not include premium cigars and hookah tobacco. And the ban applies to both in-store purchasing and vending machines. So to be clear, if Prop 31 passes, it would uphold that ban on flavored tobacco sales. The law would go into effect. It would include a $250 fine on retailers for each sale in violation of the law. That's the enforcement mechanism in this law. It's helpful to note that there can be regulations on tobacco products at the federal, the state, and the local levels. So state and local laws can't change uh, product standards, but they can be stricter than federal rules. So federal law currently bans all flavored cigarettes, except for menthols. The FDA is actually considering a ban on menthol flavored cigarettes and flavored cigars, but that decision hasn't been made yet. And then in addition, it's good to know that the city of San Diego has actually passed a ban on flavored vapes and electronic cigarettes that will go into effect on January 1st, 2020. Of course, if Proposition 31 passes and this law goes into effect, then that ordinance would be moot. Um, but it's just something to be aware of. Currently, about a third of Californians live in a jurisdiction with stricter local rules on certain flavored tobacco products. Is that the hookah? Uh, so this one, hookah is not included in this proposition, specifically, yeah. Okay, so you can see here that the fiscal effects of Proposition 31 um, are not clear if it passes. The state raises about $2 billion in ta uh, taxes on tobacco sales currently. The wide range in this estimate is because the response by tobacco consumers is uncertain. You know, they might buy other forms of legal tobacco or they might decide, you know, it doesn't have flavoring, it's not for me. Um, clearly then that would lower revenues. Of course, there could potentially be a lowered health care cost to the state if less people use tobacco products and that could offset the loss in tax revenue. We've got the supporters of Proposition 31, and the arguments made in favor of Prop 31 are that Big Tobacco has spent millions lobbying so California retailers can keep selling the candy-flavored products they market to children. More than two million middle and high school students now use e-cigarettes. Four out of five kids who have used tobacco started with a flavored product. Many e-cigarette users say that they use them for the flavors. SB 793, which is the law underlying this, does not criminalize individuals from purchasing, using, or possessing flavored tobacco products, which refutes a claim that the tobacco industry has been using. And the claim that these uh, supporters are saying is that they're saying that the passage of SB 793 will make it easier for police to harass people who use menthol cigarettes, especially among African Americans. So these supporters are saying that that's not a true argument because they won't be personally um, prosecuting people. Okay, so the opponents of Proposition 31 argue that uh, youth should never have access to any tobacco products, but this can be achieved without imposing a total prohibition on products that millions of adults choose to use. The law is unfair, particularly since lawmakers have exempted hookah 
expensive cigars and flavored pipe tobacco from the prohibition. And the prohibition will hurt small local businesses and jobs as the products are pushed from licensed, conscientious retailers to an underground market, leading to increased youth access, crime, and other social or criminal justice concerns for many California residents. Finally, the state will lose valuable revenue that supports health care. So a yes vote means that yes vote means you support the legislation that prohibits stores and vending machines from selling most flavored tobacco products and tobacco product flavor enhancers. A no vote means that you want to repeal the legislation that underlies this and believe that stores and vending machines should still be allowed um, to continue selling those flavored tobacco products. All right, we made it through. I have a question. Oh, I may in my paperwork, and I can look at that while Mary's speaking. Even if it's hazard, then it's probably a good idea Yeah, I'm not, for my, you know, it's, they're not supposed to, you know, I mean, it's illegal, but I, I'm not sure about that. I can see if I have something in some of the paperwork there. It's a little confusing, um, you know, if it passes or doesn't pass. Yeah. The way it's written, because just like she said, if it passes, that's the opposite of what she's talking. So it's easy to vote. Right, yeah, the and, it's right. and it's referendums in particular can be confusing, so that's why we try to really drive home what a yes vote, kind of sometimes not talking about the underlying yeah. stuff and just saying, okay, if you vote yes, this is what's going to happen. If you vote no, this is what's going to happen. So. It doesn't say that in the guide. Yeah, well, <laughs> there's a lot of uh, disagreement about how the guide sometimes presents things, uh, for sure. Yes, ma'am. Exactly. Yes. So this. Well, so the the original one was passed by the legislature. Um, so we didn't vote on that. So this is the first time we're voting on this. And and yes, what underlies it is we're voting to say whether that legislation is enacted. But sometimes it's just easier to say, really, you know, yes means you want to ban the tobacco, the flavored tobacco products, whereas no means you don't. Yeah. So, all right. Well, way in the back there. <laughs> oh, we had that discussion in our meeting. We we think it's because the legislature put forth, you know, Proposition 1, and they really wanted it up front, and they have the power to do that. I've seen in some past years, like, there's a 1A where the legislature was like, oh, we want to be in front, but we didn't get there in time, so we're going to be 1A. So that that's what we came up with. Yeah. But they actually number every year. It's a con usually the numbers are continuous from the last year. I think they go up to 100 and then they start over again. So, Okay, I think I'm going to pause there because we got to keep moving. Thank you all for being such a great audience. <laughs>
some kind of disaster or crop failure, they can, the county can provide some tax relief for that. Although from what I've been told, marijuana is pretty easy to grow, I don't know. Um, <laughs> so it got on the ballot because um, again, there, there's more interest in this line of business. The, there are the existing cannabis businesses, but so far, even though they receive county services, they are not being taxed. So the Board of Supervisors put this on the ballot. It wasn't an initiative. It's estimated that it would uh, generate quite a bit of money, as you can see. Um, net the, the cost for some additional staffing and some regulatory taxes. So here are the official supporters, and the supporters say that it's a bipartisan solution to advance a safe, regulated, and legal adult cannabis market. Um, the revenues would go to fund parks, fire safety, roads, health, social equity, increased enforcement of illegal cannabis operations. It would be paid solely by cannabis businesses in the unincorporated areas, and like I said, every aspect of, along the chain of the business. Opponents say that the tax is unfair because it only applies to businesses in un unincorporated areas, but the revenue could be used anywhere in the county. They also say that since it only applies to unincorporated areas, only those voters should be allowed to vote on Measure A, not all of us. So a yes vote means that there would be a new tax allowed on all cannabis businesses in the unincorporated area. A no vote means that these businesses would continue to not be taxed. So any quick questions on, right, yes? Any idea about the tax revenue from existing businesses in incorporated areas? I, I don't have those figures. It's been substantial. If, if, <laughs> Probably if it weren't, then the county wouldn't be looking to uh, <laughs> cash in as well. And part of, if you remember when, when California legalized uh, recreational use of uh, marijuana and cannabis, the, the argument, the main argument would, was that it would be a, a windfall for, for local governments. I think the state, there's state taxes as well. So that was part of the argument in favor of legalizing it in the first place. Yes. Give me an example of an unincorporated area. Okay, that's a good question. So uh, if you drive out to Valley Center, it's a little town, but it, it uh, is not, it does, it's not an incorporated entity like the city of La Mesa or the city of San Diego or Chula Vista. And there are a number of places like that, Borrego Springs. Or you could just live in the country. You could live in Santa Isabel or someplace like that. A lot of people do live in the inc unincorporated area. Yes. Okay, I didn't know that. Yeah. So a few years ago, I I taught school in Santee for years. A few years ago, they became incorp unincorpor I mean, they became incorporated, and there are pros and cons to that process. So, yeah, real quickly. So it's 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 a sales tax. No, the this. Uh, well, it might be passed on to the consumer, but it's it's not the consumer who's taxed. It's the businesses. It's a business tax. All right, let's go on to Measure B. I have to keep both devices going here. It's not easy. Um, uh, this would amend the municipal code, and it was put on the ballot by the city council and it deals with what's known as the People's Ordinance. And the People's Ordinance is what says that for about half of the population, living uh, people who live um, in single family homes, your trash collection is free. So Measure B would get rid of the prohibition that exists now. So in the 80s, there were a couple of votes that cemented this idea of the people's ordinance that you could not charge for trash service. That is, if you live on a, where you could take your trash out to the curb and you live in a single family home. 
This does not directly impose a new fee, but it would allow the city to charge a fee for providing this uh, service. Um, it also requires a cost of service study, public noticing, and a public hearing. So the city, if they were going to impose a fee for trash collection, would have to determine what a reasonable cost for that is. And by state law, any fee cannot exceed the cost of providing the service. So this got on the ballot by three different grand juries across time um, recommending that it be put there. And in the interest of disclosure, this is one of the, um, I think the only local one where the League of Women Voters has signed the argument. So various community groups, a number, not just the League, has been asking the City Council to put this on the ballot and they voted to do so. The goal, the, the rationale behind doing so was that um, the city needs to recover the cost, which keeps going up, of, of uh, providing these services. Then a new thing that's happened recently, you may be aware of something called SB 1383. So this mandates, although it's not happening yet in San Diego because of the cost, this mandates that we segregate our organic waste, our food waste, because food waste is a major contributor to, to methane gases and climate change. And it would go into a compost bin, so there'd be another aspect to our trash collection. Um, this last part I mentioned, okay. So the best estimate of what it would cost is between 23 and 29 dollars per month. Uh, I'm guessing, I'm more than guessing, it would probably go on to your annual property tax bill. I don't, or you might get a monthly bill like you do for water or every other month. That, that level of detail isn't in this uh, measure. Um, so here are the supporters, some of them, and um, they argue that there's potential to offer additional services if you could charge for it. Maybe bulky items, maybe electronic waste, this kind of thing. It would be easier to gather the organic waste, uh, which is, would help us achieve our climate action goals. Um, and the, they also clarified that California, I mean, I, I'm sorry, San Diego is the only jurisdiction in California that doesn't charge for trash. So that we're rather, this people's ordinance is rather unique. Um, you mean San Diego City? So, yeah. it, um, they also argue that it's inequitable. And uh, so if you live on a public street, I happen to live on a quote, private street, so I, I pay for my trash collection through my HOA. But if you, if you live on a public street like my neighbor does, I'm at the end of the road, um, they get theirs uh, for free. So that is an argument uh, which you may or may not agree with, but that only some people are getting, roughly half of San Diegans are getting the free pickup. If you live in a condo or an apartment, a gated community and so forth, you're not getting the free pickup. Um, they also say that if you charge a fee, we could modernize our trash collection services, our waste management services. Opponents say, however, that the voters have made it clear that they support the People's Ordinance through their votes uh, a number of years ago, that we don't need yet another fee on top of the already high cost of living in San Diego. They argue that a better solution would to make it more equitable would be to apply the people's ordinance to everybody in San Diego and make trash collection free to, to all. And they say that if this passes, it could cost you between $350 and $500 a year. So we always like to kind of summarize what a yes or no vote means. If you vote yes, you would amend the city charter to allow the city to charge a fee for waste management service that would be no more than the calculated cost of providing that service. A no vote means you want to maintain the status quo for the people's ordinance the way it is now. Okay, so that's B. Any questions 
in the back, yeah, right there. So the way it is now, not not prop, not measure be the way it is now, uh, because of the way the people's ordinance was written. You, if you are, live at a residence on a single family street where you can roll your trash bins out to the curb, you're not charged for trash pickup. However, if close by there's a condo complex or apartment complex, they do pay. So that's the, that's the status quo. Okay. So, so this so so if this passes, if this passes, then um, the people who are currently not paying would be charged. So every it would it would level the playing field is, is the argument. So we wouldn't have this two tier system which we have now, where some people pay for trash services and some people don't. Okay, right there, yes. But his point was that um, the people that are like in condos and apartments are already paying because of, it's added into the cost of it. So that, I mean, the, the people that own it. Are right, the they pay tri private trash collection right. services. So will those two um, run together simultaneously? I mean, are they all going to Well, that's, that's, a little un that's a little unclear. The main point would be that what's the benefit that some people get now would that that every, everybody the, the main point to distill it is that everyone would have to pay something for uh, service there's this is going to be studied and there are going to be public hearings so exactly how it would play out is just an unknown and I, I don't think we should try to go there yes Well, we, we don't know long, but there's this, if you vote yes on this, you are not voting to impose a fee. You are getting rid of the prohibition against charging the fee. Does that make sense? That's, it just, it's, it's really fairly basic. So, yes. Well, it, it comes out of the general fund. But like I said, there's that, we're the only city that does it this way. Every other, even the San Diego County, La Mesa, Chula Vista, so forth, you pay a fee for trash collection. If you live in, the San, in a single family house in San Diego, you do not. So that's something to keep in mind. Beryl. If you vote yes to this, nothing's gonna change as far as the trash pickup goes. Until the city does a study and right. Yeah, I think, uh, let's take one more. We need to move on, yes. I just wanted to add, I manage property, and the buildings that we have the apartments in is free pickup in the beach areas. There's no charges to the landlords or anything. We're responsible for a buying the trash cans, um, but that's it. And okay. making sure that they're in good order. But other than paying for the trash pickup for apartment buildings, at least Okay, maybe because you have e easy access to a, a pickup point. Okay, I'm going to I'm going to move this along. <laughs> Measure C. Um, this is a little bit less complicated, I think. Okay. <laughs> this um, has to do with the height limit. It's basically a redo of something you've all voted on uh, in 2020. It would exclude a specific geographic area, which I'll show you in, in a minute, the Midway Pacific Highway Community Plan area from the 30-foot height limit on buildings in the coastal zone. And that height limit is something that the voters of San Diego put into effect back in the 70s. It was also put on the a ballot by the city council. So I hope you can see this. The, Oh, what's that? Oh, that's the air conditioning. Oh, dear, dear. Did I do something? Okay, thank you. Um, so you can see the area in yellow 
we all know where the sports arena is. We all kind of know what that area looks like. So it's definitely coastal. It's west of I-5. It's not oceanfront, it's not beachfront, but it is what within the coastal zone where there is currently a 30-foot height limit. If this is approved, building heights in this area would be regulated by the height limit of the underlying zoning. So there might still be some restrictions on how, how high you could go. The rest of the coastal zone, which you could see, you know, Point Loma and Mission Beach there, that would remain unchanged. It only applies to that area in yellow. This is essentially a redo of Measure E approved by the voters in 2020. That was overturned by a court ruling in 2021. The judge agreed with the people bringing the suit that the environmental impact report, the EIR, was inadequate. Well, in early September, the same group filed a suit lawsuit saying even the redo, you can see this last bullet point, that the city has done a new EIR. The opposition says, says nope, that's not good enough. So um, this will all play out in the legal system, I'm sure. In terms of fiscal effects, if you have more people, if you develop this area and have a lot more residents, they will need more services, but they will also be uh, paying more sales tax, income tax, property taxes. So it's probably something of a wash. It's unknown. So supporters, and I'll show you those in a minute, they contend that this measure, I'm sorry, measure C would create thousands of affordable homes and good paying jobs, revitalize the area, and um, also a catalyst to modernize the sports arena, which supporters say is now obsolete. Um, and then the opponents say that it would allow for overly dense, expensive apartments in the coastal zone, and that politicians put it on the ballot to reward developer interests, translate donors, and that it would cost a lot to taxpayers ultimately. So here are some of the supporters. Sorry, this is in a little different order than some of our other ones. And, and some of the opponents, including Save Our Access, which is the group that has filed these lawsuits. Could you go back to the other screen? You just kind of click on the support. Okay. I'm sorry. Okay. Well, you know, these things, real quickly, are, are a little tricky sometimes on the environmental side because, um, so, so you see here, we have the Earth Day people on that side, but we have the Climate Action Campaign. The idea being uh, that with more infill and less sprawl, you can have more transit, in theory, and reduce um, car, uh, dependency on cars, hence on emissions. And no money was raised? OK, real, you'll see these are blank about the money, and I apologize for that. We simply, at the time that this was published, and even now, we just don't have good information. There isn't a a lot of money being raised really on any of these local measures. So um, I'm going to go summarize and then I'll take a question or two. So a yes vote means that you approve of no longer uh, imposing the 30 foot height limit, coastal zone height limit on this particular part of the city. And a no vote means that you want to keep that height limit in place. Okay, question. Does, it, does this conflict with the California Coastal Com uh, Commission's control of, of height limits at, at the coast? This one really doesn't, no, okay. no, yes. Well, what, what, is, what is it you want to say? Okay. Uh -huh. next-door neighbor, and I've been contacting a lot of people, so many uh, people I see in here, I've been contacting. 
session. I went to the city council meeting on the 13th, I believe, of September, and there was really very <coughs> little information, and basically they don't have a plan. What they're proposing is this is the area they're talking about eliminating the 30-foot building height limit. That's the Pacific Highway corridor, folks. That's right at your back door. And uh, this is including Midway, MCRD, which they're planning on taking over, the convention center is a small parcel. Navmore, all those buildings, right, that backs up right to Old Town, all the way down the Pacific Corridor to Laurel Street. So okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm going to, that's not really fair to, like, know right. the other side. I'm, I'm saying, if you have to know, understand, yeah. we really can't yeah. That's right, we, we, it, it should really be more questions, and I, I, I agree, Jenny, sorry. What I would say, then, to provide that uh, perspective is, this, there is no plan in this, in this proposal. It is not, there's, there's no development plan. It, you also always have to go back to what's the question. And the question is simply, for this area, do you want to retain the 30 foot height limit? And I should say that, um, let me go back, um, that, uh, where, where is it? Um, here we go, the community, Planner, the community planning group in this area does favor uh, Measure C. So, you know, in, in terms of people with environmental in interests, it kind of cuts both ways. But the plan, the local planning group, uh, is behind this as well, and even though there's plenty of opposition as as we've now seen. So, uh, let's just a couple more questions, and then we need to move on. Yes, somebody who hasn't spoken yet, right? Mm -hmm. It, the airport is, uh, the, the airport is not part of this area. You always have to. It, it's it's not in the flight path, to best of my knowledge. But but the port authority would be on top of this, I'm sure. A couple questions back here, and then I'm really going to move on. Yeah. So um, I'm part of the district city, and the judge ordered them to do a more thorough uh, EIR. EIR, yeah. The judge ordered them to do some. Specific things. They failed to do that. They have not met the judge's requirements at all. Okay. And, and then the other thing is, is it is part of the airport. The airport is already doing almost a four billion dollar improvement. Huh. Yeah. Right now it's underway, and it is part of that area. Well, we, I could go back to the map. I don't think so. The um, the e, yes, the judge said with the original proposition, the EIR didn't go far enough. The groups opposing this are saying that's still an inadequate EIR. This will all be hammered out in the courts, yes. I'm a vice chair for one of the Pinellas Community Planning Boards. I'm on my third term, and I am in Point Loma, and um, I just want, the one thing I want to say about this measure is you do your research, because they're starting with Midway. A lot of these gigantic projects, if you drive around um, Mission Hills, don't go to the planning boards anymore. They're slipping under the rug, and the thing about this measure is if they're picking midway and they're labeling that very clearly and that's why people are voting for it it's not in their backyard it's going to come to your backyard okay. eventually down the line so yeah and i was going to mention boards, and then we're going to i'm going to go to the next one i just want to are talked about on the planning hi boards, i just want to mention i usually say it at the beginning sorry Questions answer, they end in a question mark, so let's try to keep right. the questions, okay? Thank you, I appreciate Jenny. that everyone has a lot to say, but we just want to get information out. Y'all can stand outside and tell each other what okay. you think, okay? So, some that I did actually intend to say that one of the arguments against it is the classic slippery slope thing. I failed to do that. Okay, moving along to Measure D. This has to do with PLAs. Uh, project labor agreements, which are contracts between uh, uh, con building contractors and a labor union. This was also put on the ballot by the city council. Okay, I lost my notes again. Okay. 
the um, currently there is a ban on requiring project labor agreements, PLAs for city projects. This measure would remove the ban, but it would not mandate the use of PLAs. And the reason the city council put this on the ballot is we're asked to make, consider Measure D because there's a new state law since the earlier ban was passed, SB 922, which would cut funding from cities with any law, perhaps such as the one we have currently, that quote, prohibits, limits, or constrains these agreements. So it's kind of, the idea is to be on the safe side that we might uh, prevent us from, from losing state funding. So th basically that's what I was explaining. Um, supporters, let me go back. Supporters claim that it helps protect San Diego from losing potentially millions of state funding that is necessary for the city, among other things, to meet climate change threats. They say it would clarify any ambiguity, uncertainty, or potential conflict between the municipal code as it stands currently. It's a real question mark. I'm sorry, I, I got a little out of order. It's a real question mark in terms of fiscal. So back to support. Um, here are the different people who have signed uh, the argument or who favor it for the reasons I said, that uh, there's fear that with this new state law, San Diego could be at risk of losing funding with the present language banning requiring a PLA. It requires public disclosure of city contracting, tracking hiring so that local citizens could be prioritized. It had, there are some workforce protections and anti-discrimination provisions. However, the opponents point out that in 2012, voters clearly approved a ballot measure called the, called the Fair and Open Competition for Taxpayer-Funded Projects and that that proposition did protect access to state infrastructure funds because it said, well, if they're really required in order to get the money. So this is kind of the debate. Is this needed to make sure that we're not um, going to lose state funds or not? The main argument is that Measure D discriminates against 80%, they, uh, they say, of the local construction workforce, included including underrepresented minority groups. They also contend that it discriminates against local apprenticeship programs, such as those sponsored by the National Black Contractors Association. So, Measure D. You vote yes if you want to override Proposition A from 10 years ago and amend the city charter to remove the ban on using PLAs. Doesn't require them you're just removing this ban. A no vote means you like the ban, you wanna continue the terms of Prop A, um, and that's basically it. It's not really too hard to understand, I don't think, so um, yes. So are you saying basically that, um, that the, the D, if you support it, you're in favor of a labor agreement type of a hiring? You're in favor of not prohibiting them, to, uh, for allowing them. You're, because this would not mandate, this does not mandate PLAs. It just gets rid of the ban on requiring PLAs. Right now, you cannot hire people that are part of the union. No, no, no. It just, a lot of the workers are part of the union. It just, currently, the city cannot require a, a PLA. That's what, that's the status quo. A, a, a PLA, I'm sorry, a PLA, a pro. What does that mean? What's a project labor? I'm okay, it's it's without. It's basically a contract between. So you hire such and such construction company, one big enough to do a major project for the city. They can uh, contract with a labor union about certain um, wage safety. Uh, all kinds of labor protections. There's, it's a contract between basically labor and management. That's what it is. Okay. 
Measure H. This is this one's pretty easy, I think. So uh, it's another one put on by the city council, and it would authorize child care facilities uh, on dedicated parkland. The city has identified 18 libraries, 42 park and rec centers, and 12 office buildings. These are all city-owned properties that would be allowed, if this should pass, to house child care. And part of the rationale for this is that with the pandemic, we lost 522 child care centers that, that closed then. So, um, okay, I said that. Um, we really don't know the fiscal impacts because let's say you have a, a rec center and part of it is kind of underutilized and maybe you could put a child care facility in there Maybe it's run by a nonprofit, maybe a for-profit company. How much of the improvements necessary would be paid by those entities? How much by the city? Those details are not, are not in this. So that's pretty unknown. Here are the people in support. They've signed the ballot argument. They remind us that there are over 74,000 children under the age of five who lack access to licensed child care and that this is only intensified with the pandemic. They argue that Measure H would allow working families to no longer have to make the difficult choice between losing their job or taking care of children. Now there's no organized opposition to Prop H, but I know that there are some citizens who are concerned about using dedicated par parkland for this purpose. So it's kind of, again, the kind of the slippery slope argument. Any questions on this one? Okay, yes. Well, the, the funding, that's, that's uh, probably most likely the child care providers. It just allows, this really isn't about the city paying for it. It allows where it's currently prohibited. If there's, if there's underutilized city space in a library and a rec center and so forth, right now, you can't legally put child care centers there. This would allow it, that's all. The, the, the mechanisms of funding and so forth are not part of this. Or, or a lot of them are run by nonprofits. could be both, yeah. The Y, for example, runs child care centers, okay? Goody, all right. <laughs> Measure U is the only bond issue this time it was put on by the school board, San Diego City uh, Unified School District. It would allow the district to borrow $3.2 billion to fund a variety of projects across its 200 educational facilities. And um, many of those would involve um, safety, uh, making our schools more secure in uh, um, in terms of, of school shootings, which is, well, I don't want to, I, I was at a school that had a school shooting. So this is, anyway, it's, it's a shame that we have to spend, uh, to, to, to worry about this so much. But that's neither here nor there. Okay. It would do a lot of other things. It would modernize classrooms in terms of particularly uh, STEM classes and laboratories, this kind of thing. Um, property taxes would not in, increase. It would just continue the, the tax rate that's there now. And some of the, it would, it kind of replaces the Prop Z that you voted on a number of years ago that those funds are expiring. This kind of fills in. So the usual things, the leaky roofs, the asbestos, the lead paint, the mold, classroom security, as I mentioned. A couple of new things I want to point out. Um, there's a, by 2025, there's going to be a new grade basically added in, in California public schools, um, transitional kindergarten. So it, for these little people, this would provide a more appropriate sized bathrooms and drinking fountains and playgrounds and all of that. Another thing it would do that's new is at some point, don't ask me when, 
the district offices are going to use, move from University Heights, where they are now, out to Kearney Mesa. And the current district-owned land in, in University Heights would be transitioned to a 500 affordable housing units for district employees. Another thing to be aware of, if you seem seems like you vote on these fairly often, is the fourth bond measure like this since 2008. I've already said this. Six cents per $100 of assessed value, that is remains unchanged from now. So. Uh, it, for district employees, it could be uh, uh, custodians or support staff or office workers, yeah. Um, supporters say that there's still a lot of work to be done to modernize our schools and make them safer and more secure. That it will help prepare students for 21st century jobs by renovating classrooms and science labs with up-to-date technology. That will enhance security, you know, better cameras, better access or, or more limited access. Um, there, here's some of the things it would do. Supporters say. And, and and basically these arguments just kind of reiterate what's what's in the measure. There is no uh, official ballot argument, but of course there's always concern uh, among taxpayers about adding to the district's indebtedness. Any questions on measure U? Yes. It, that is interesting. It doesn't say that they do. Um, the Taxpayers Association does, and sometimes they oppose these things. I should find that out. Thank you. Uh, they, they, may, they may be neutral on this. And then real quickly, here are some important dates. Uh, if you have people you know who haven't registered to vote, I know you all have. Tell them to go online if they're young. That's the only way they'll do it by October 24th. You'll get your ballot soon. Election day is November 8th, and thank you for, I'm glad so many of you are interested in these complicated measures. All right.